In this short video, I want to introduce a massive area of financial markets and one that's packed full of jargon, and that is derivatives. So, with no more ado. They are, unfortunately, capable of attracting some bad press. Financial weapons of mass destruction is the way that Warren Buffett described a particular type of derivative that I won't be dealing with in this presentation, and that kind of got plastered across the whole derivatives world. They are a way you can lose money quickly. They are dangerous in the wrong hands, but then in fairness, so is my lawnmower. All right, in the right hands, derivatives can be used very safely. What do I mean by that? Well, the basic idea is you've got a contract that der derives its value from something else. So the word derivative comes from the idea that the derivative contract, whatever it is, is built on what is happening to something else, shares, currencies, commodities, whatever it happens to be. And there are two uses, and it's the one on the left that gets all the press, speculation. Derivatives can be used to make a lot of money, and they're geared so you get a lot of bang for your buck. All right? And that's the bit where, as I say, the press tends to focus. On the right-hand side, there's a perfectly safe use for derivatives, which is hedging. And that's the exact opposite. That is reducing risk and trying to avoid losing money. And I want to try and convey both of those sides in this short presentation. Now, there are three types of derivative. I'm going to deal with two. The two I'm going to take on here are the ones that retail investors can get somewhere near with products designed for them, forwards and futures, and options. All right, now, in the retail world, they're called other things, like spread bets and traded options, but I'll deal with those in future presentations. It's these things that form the nuts and bolts of those products. Swaps are the third type of derivative, but those are actually normally only used by big institutions and so on, and corporates. So I'll leave those to one side and take them on perhaps in a separate presentation. So, with no more ado, forwards and futures part one. All right, this is the oldest and most straightforward use of a forward contract. If you're wondering why I've got two words up there, futures are just the exchange tradable version of forwards. Much the same product. Here's a basic contract, and these go back centuries. I agree to sell you one tonne of copper for $7,000 in three months' time. Why? If I'm a copper producer, that hedges the price. I now know what I will get for copper in three months' time. If the price rises, I'll be sad because I could have sold the copper for more. If it falls, I'll be happy because I'm guaranteed $7,000. That's the nature of hedging. You take out risk, but the price you pay is you may not squeeze out as much profit as you would have done without the contract. Guy on the right maybe needs copper, all right, uses it in a manufacturing process, and is quite happy to lock in a price in three months' time. No uncertainty there. I know what I'm going to have to pay. Great. OK, maybe if the market price is lower, I could have got the copper cheaper in three months' time, but that's life. OK? So three months goes by, and a ton of copper is delivered in a mysteriously old-looking van in three months, and $7,000 goes the other way. Contract's over. Very simple. That is a hedge. It's a hedge for the person selling. They knew they'd get $7,000, and that's what they got. And it's a hedge for the person buying, because they're not going to pay more than $7,000, so it probably suits both of them. However, speculators can also play around with these contracts. And I'll try and give you a little flavour as to how. All right, let's do the same contract from the start, but just adjust the facts slightly. So we kick off. I agree to sell you, same wording, one tonne of copper for $7,000 in three months' time. Exactly the same opening contract, if you like. Two months go by and the copper price has moved up to $8,000. This is the market price of copper on the metals exchange, if you like. Nothing to do with the fixed price contract that these two have decided to sign between them. Now, if you're the person on the left, you'd be thinking, oh, crikey, I shouldn't have locked in to sell for 7,000. I mean, I can already get 8,000, and the contract's not even finished yet. And the guy on the right is thinking, phew, glad I signed that contract, because without it, I'll be paying the market $8,000. So the guy on the left might say, any chance we can cancel the contract and really work for me anymore? The guy on the right, unless he's mad, is going to say, I don't think so, unless you pay me to do exactly that for you. I want $1,000. Then, fine, I'm prepared to cancel the contract, walk away. You don't deliver any copper to me, job done. So basically, the guy on the right is saying, you know, the reality is you are going to sell me in a month's time for seven. Already the market price is eight. I want compensating for the difference, and I want it more or less now, and then we'll cancel the contract. The guy on the, on the left might be thinking, I'll do that. Why? Why pay $1,000 now? Because if the copper price keeps on rising, and this guy's got his tonne of copper to sell, 
he's going to sell it for even more, you know, $10,000 in a month's time. So both sides might be prepared to just walk away and call it quits. And that gives you a flavour for how these things might become traded contracts where no copper ever moves. And the vast majority of um, contracts that involve derivatives uh, actually don't involve copper moving from warehouse to warehouse. There's some of that going on, but there's a lot of speculation going on too. That's worth bearing in mind. Okay, I did say it was a basic tour. Options, is there another way to do this? There is. Look similar, slightly different, part one. I'll sell you the right, but I want $500 for it, because I'm giving you a choice now to buy a ton of copper for $7,000 in three months. So it looks pretty similar. Same underlying copper, same price agreed, $7,000, same timing, three months, but this is flexible. This has got a choice. So you go on the right, might say, deal, have $500 up front. I'm sinking $500 into this contract because that piece of paper, once it's written out and I hold it, gives me the option to ring you anytime over the next three months once and call in my copper for $7,000 a ton. And what's more, you've got to deliver it no matter what the market price. So, what might happen is the option sits there for a while, the $500 stays over here, you can bank that or spend it, and three months go by. The copper price has moved up to 8000 so the point about this is it's an option. So are you going to make the phone call to get the copper for $7,000? Yes, you are, because otherwise you're going to be paying eight. So, the copper is delivered for the agreed contract price, which means that on the right, you've actually paid $7,000 plus the 500 premium, because that's gone, that's sunk, a bit like you know, insuring your car, the premium's gone, the matter what happens next, okay? On the left, basically, you've got $500 plus another seven for copper that's worth eight at the point the option's exercised, but that's life, okay? You win some, you lose some. Now, could that be turned into a different scenario where no copper changes hands, and that introduces the idea of trading these things? Well. If I can finish with options part two. The opening is the same, all right? Two players, I'll sell you the right for $500 to buy a ton of copper off me for $7,000 in three months time. Exactly the same word for word opening position and exactly the same motives, essentially, all right? Um, so over here, someone worried about the copper price rising. Over here, someone worried about the opposite. All right, I'm prepared to cash in on that basis. So, there's the opening deal. You hold an option, in the old days, these were physical pieces of paper, on the right-hand side, and you've written it, and then sold it on the left-hand side. Now, let's change the facts very slightly. Very slightly. Two months later, the copper price is 8,000. So, two months in. Now, remember, the phone call to get that ton of copper for $7,000 can come in any time in the next three months. You've paid the $500 for that flexibility but it hasn't come in yet. And two months later, the copper price is $8,000. So this option is already in the money, as they call it. Why? Because it's valuable. To be able to buy on the right-hand side something for seven that's already worth eight, great. There's money there, quite literally. Now, red-faced option writer on the left-hand side thinking, oh, darn it, why did I give anyone the right to buy copper for me for seven when the market price is eight? That's crazy. I should never have done it. So. On the left, any chance I can buy the option back? And then put it in a bin, frankly. All right, any chance I can take out that risk? And the guy on the right might be thinking, yeah, all right, I don't really want the copper anymore. Change my mind. I don't want a ton of copper arriving in a van, but I do want compensating for getting the direction of the copper price right. Because, you know, basically, if you had, if you had to go and buy copper now, the red-faced guy, it cost you $8,000, so you shouldn't, sorry, if, you're, if I ring you and ask for the copper, all right, it's $7,000 in the contract and the market price is eight, so there's a benefit of $1,000 in there built in, all right? And on top of that, if you're asking to buy the option back from me a month early, that's worth another $200. Because if I keep that bit of piece, piece of paper and the copper price keeps rising, I can make even more money. Yeah, the benefit rises over time. So basically, I want $1,000 for the difference between the price you agreed and the market price now. And I also want something for the fact I'm agreeing to cancel the contract early. So let's call it $1,200. And assuming your red-faced guy on the left agrees, $1,200 goes over there, and the option is cancelled and resides back 
with the person who originally wrote it. And they can now put it in the bin if they want. Net effect, okay, this guy is now free to sell a ton of copper to anybody at the market price whenever he likes because the option is now gone. He's now holding the option over here if you like. On the right hand side, this guy has made a profit of the difference between that and that. That's a $700 profit for doing very little. Right, no copper's changed hands, just taking a bit of a punt, you might say, on the copper price. So there it is, basic forwards futures, basic options, two uses, hedging to reduce price risk, speculating to take a gamble on the price, and the real nuts and bolts of the way these contracts work. If you'd like to hear more about either, very happy to cover that, along with some of the retail products that are built on these in future videos.